Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to jump into my slides because I know we're trying to move on. Uh, so some of these first two slides are introductory in, um, uh, in many of the different sessions. We've, we've talked about what is sepsis and the epidemiology, so I won't sort of belabor that, but to remind ourselves that sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction uh, due to a dysregulated host response to an infection and that infection be, can be caused uh, from bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses. And as uh, Dr. Nagvi uh, told us about the global burden of disease, um, this uh, has resulted in almost 15 million cases uh, uh, with a consequence of deaths in 11 million, um, and that corresponds with 20% of all annual global deaths. And also shown earlier today, there's a disproportionate burden of mortality um, from sepsis in sub-Saharan Africa. And so I was asked uh, to talk about uh, the potential challenges of addressing sepsis in Africa, but as you saw maybe from my title slide, I've t I will also be taking the liberties of talking about opportunities um, in that same space. Uh, as we move into thinking about addressing sepsis in sub-Saharan Africa, um, just some important considerations. Um, just over a decade ago, there was a survey that was done uh, in sub-Saharan Africa that looked at the feasibility of being able to implement the International Guidelines for Sepsis, or the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And this was done across 185 hospitals in 24 countries. And what it demonstrated was that there was a massive disparity in the number of African hospitals when compared to hospitals in the U.S. or other high-income country settings with only uh, under 2% of the, the hospitals from, from Africa able to implement these uh, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines in full. Moving 10 years later, the guidelines have been updated and actually the process has been updated whereby um, representatives from low and middle income countries have been included in that process and the, uh, the graded recommendations sort of incorporates uh, uh, the context and, and the availability of resources to be able to implement those guidelines. This is an, uh, it's a process that's evolving um, and, 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 and will conti continue to improve as the new guidance comes around. Um, but as we think about that, in that context, I think there are probably three kind of considerations that we should think about when we're looking at Sub-Saharan Africa. Number one are key subgroups. So H or sepsis in the context of uh, conditions like HIV or malnourishment, um, also non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes or malignancy, um, but also considering uh, the delivery of sepsis care um, in what is predominantly non-ICU settings. So a lot of what we um, uh, might be used to here in Germany or uh, where I've worked in, in the U.S. and in the U.K., um, uh, is ICU uh, sort of based care of sepsis, but um, uh, uh, most of this care is done on, on medical wards. Um, in addition, just thinking about resource constraints as an example uh, of one of the discussions that came up during the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines was the limited recourse to mechanical ventilation and uh, ICU level care. And so when you have that limited recourse, how does that maybe impact the way you might recommend delivering fluids uh, and uh, the extent of fluid resuscitation or the time that you would be able to deliver pressors um, on a, uh, uh, through a peripheral line versus a central line? Um, and then also thinking about challenges in providing continuous monitoring, static versus dynamic. Um, and then the third one is sort of just thinking about the microbial milieu. Others have talked about this, and I'll talk a little bit about this in, in subsequent slides, but really just recognizing that there's a broad differential diagnosis. Antimicrobial resistance has come up multiple times today. Um, and also just considering that maybe different pathogens result in different pathophysiology. Um, we are learning that more with uh, one of the most common causes among HIV-infected patients uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is myco mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, bloodstream infection, um, and that compared to dengue, malaria, and, you know, sort of conventional gram-negative uh, rod bacteremia. So 
to for the for the next bit of my talk, I'm really going to just try and highlight a few priority areas. There are many that c could be highlighted, but in the time left, I I'd like to highlight four. Um, and so first, uh, this would be sort of for addressing sepsis and the challenges and opportunities in the next 10 years, um, is to think about galvanizing an African research network uh, or multiple networks on sepsis that improve our understanding of epidemiology and ultimately can enable, you know, sort of platforms for clinical trials uh, of targeted therapeutics uh, within, within the region. Um, as we know, as we've already heard, uh, sepsis epidemiology um, uh, uh, in, in Africa in particular um, is, is limited in terms of the data that support those. So estimates, in fact, from the global burden of disease were extrapolated from data from Mexico. Um, and so having increasing studies, the research infrastructure to look at hospital level data um, that helps to differentiate the differences between uh, sepsis in different age groups, whether they're you know, children under five, adolescents, uh, non-pregnant adults, or uh, uh, women with peripartum sepsis. Um, but also thinking about, uh, given the context of many of the settings in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the difference between community and hospital um, uh, sort of epidemiology related to sepsis. So uh, what is the additional burden of sepsis that's not yet counted um, among patients who end up dying in the community and do not make it in the hospital? Uh, so that's a, it's an important sort of blind spot in our understanding of the epi. Um, and this is work uh, that uh, we have started to do um, through funding that we have had over the last few years uh, from the UK National Institute of Health Research um, through a, a consortium called the African Research Collaboration on Sepsis. And here we were working in 22 hospitals across 10 different countries. And one of our studies, the uh, baseline African sepsis incident study, uh, allowed us to do to look at small looks using a short uh, period incidence kind of um, uh, methodology to, to try and estimate incidence and prevalence and we just kind of completed the data collection or in the process of analysis and so maybe the next time we have uh, this meeting we'll be able to report on that. So the next, um, sorry about that, uh, the next sort of priority area is thinking about advancing near patient diagnostics and host response platforms for sepsis. So what we know from um, uh, studies that have been done in the area, here's an example uh, from John Crump and his group in Tanzania that looked at hospitalized febrile uh, adult patients. And um, in, in this particular study, uh, clinicians initially uh, thought that the patient had malaria in 61% of the cases, but it was only confirmed in 1.6%. Um, and with bloodstream infections uh, representing another 28% using conventional blood culture methods, um, and where a third of them didn't have a diagnosis, but using molecular and ser serologic methods, you were able to understand that zoonotic diseases also contributed um, uh, for a, a substantial percentage of, uh, of this population. Um, and so therefore, you know, sort of having access to, you know, sort of a broad range of uh, diagnostic methods, uh, which is not um, uh, necessarily uh, readily available across all settings in Sub-Saharan Africa, needs to be changed so that it, it, it is, or at least have different platforms for that. Um, I won't say much more about AMR other than highlight uh, in the recent paper that came out um, from uh, Dr. Naviz and, and his group, um, that the global burden of AMR is particularly high uh, and the debts associated with that uh, that are associated and attributable to AMR are, are greatest in Sub-Saharan Africa as indicated um, on, on those left bars that are in the different shades of green. Um, and then also just thinking about the host response to sepsis. Um, this uh, paper that was published several years ago um, uh, demonstrated that the transcriptional response to infection was stronger in macrophages from those of Afri people of African descent versus European descent, um, and especially among inflammatory response genes. And so thinking about these profiles, the transcriptomic and host response profiles can help us to stratify patients based on subgroups and ultimately use that to sort of uh, understand prognosis and or target therapeutics. So all those put together would allow us to have sort of a comprehensive sepsis platform to approach patients and doing that by the bedside would, would be sort of overcoming a lot of the, uh, the technology and human resource issues that are currently there. <laughs> 
Number three is standardizing enhanced quality of care for sepsis. Talked about the guidelines already. Translating that into standards and then indicators um, is 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 critical for sort of for for use by the frontline clinician and for quality assurance by uh, sort of the policy ma policy makers and stakeholders that are involved at the country levels. You know, having thing, some things that are mobile and, and um, you know, sort of uh, decision support for clinicians uh, uh, will, will be easier in this context. And um, w increasingly, there, there is an expertise in the area of bioinformatics um, through groups like the African Center of Excellence for Bioinformatics and the, micro, uh, the Microsoft Africa Research Institute in Nairobi. Um, and this, you know, sort of taking the leap towards uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to inform uh, the type of care that can be delivered um, through a mobile app uh, is, are, are all, I think, within, within reach within the next 10 years. And so putting all those together, um, just to end with the, uh, a critical bit of policy, which is the sort of uh, uh, transforming policy, and that's engaging stakeholders, whether they're at the level, uh, and as has been talked about already, um, at, of the Ministry of Health, uh, bilateral organizations, multinational organizations, but also thinking more um, uh, kind of in a 180-degree fashion of um, uh, the perspectives from all, all people affected by sepsis, including patients. We recently published um, on uh, the experience of patients who had recovered from sepsis and their caregivers in Uganda, Malawi, and, and in PLOS Global Public Health. And not maybe surprising, but one of the things that was emphasized was uh, the dimension of experience of care was very important to the patient experience and really thinking about communication, respect, and emotional support just as much as having sort of good care as, as would be determined by clinicians is, is just as important. So I'll just leave on, on this, uh, just to say that there are promising opportunities on the horizon. Um, there's, a, there, there's a group of uh, a consortium that is, um, uh, comprises uh, uh, Charité and Dusseldorf in, in Germany and um, eight different partners across seven countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where uh, we've had some positive feedback from, from the funder in terms of our, our grants application and um, uh, all of these priorities that I've, I've discussed uh, will, will be addressed. So I'll leave that with just to say, watch this space and thank you for your time. Thank you.